Well, good evening. Once again, welcome to Cedar Hill Baptist Church. If you would, please stand and join us in singing, He Set Me Free.
us play. Father, we just thank you again for these evenings, how you have truly blessed it, Lord, and how you have truly shown us the glory of, of, of your son. Thank you so much for him and for what he has done on the cross for us so we could come to you in love and in, in thanksgiving, Lord, and thank you so much for your grace and your love in our lives, Lord. Father, I pray right now that you will just bless this service, pray that uh, your presence will be felt, and that, uh, that we will leave this place knowing more about Jesus, Lord, and that those who need to come to you in a personal loving way, tonight will be tonight. Those who need to join, I pray that tonight is the night. And those who need to follow you in baptism, Lord, I pray that they will see that tonight, Lord. Father, we love you, and we just thank you again for this evening. I pray that you will bless it, Lord. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.
Be unto your name. Anima. The word means that which helps. You see, that's what we are to do as we come alongside folk. Is tell them about the God who saves. Who, what is his name? Oh, you can do better than that. What is his name? Jesus. Jesus. The God who saves. We were eating lunch today and Charlie and I have been going and enjoying one another and we decided that we would take uh, Ben and Ryan with us today and they seated us and about an hour and a half later they came back and asked if, if we wanted any food and so I don't know uh, it didn't have any reflection on them but uh, as we talked to Katie Share like we always do. Katie, we're going to be talking to the Lord in a minute. Can we pray for you about anything? She said, no, everything's pretty good shape. I said, do you know him? As your Lord and Savior? She said, oh, yes, sir. In a few minutes, she came back and she said, I want to thank you so much. She said, I do have something I need you to pray for. My husband, Kevin. He's a new Christian, and he has to work seven days a week and hadn't been able to go to church in over a month with us. Would you pray that he won't lose his zeal for the Lord? you be praying for Kevin and Katie. Anima, Jesus. Everybody loves to hear that name. And I pray that you will be bold and sharing it wherever we go. Tonight, I want to just thank you for being here. So faithful, it's hard to believe these five fabulous fellowships are coming to an uh, end. But hadn't it been five fabulous fellowships if you've been here? Amen. It's just an, encouraged me. And uh, tonight, I look about and I think everybody's uh, been here before. We're glad to have the Bennetts all the way from uh, Missouri and the Housleys from Sevier County and uh, the Sevier County in the United States. Yeah, I think so, okay. Uh, but we're thankful for their being here, but we're just thankful for everybody uh, being here tonight. And I've got some folks, uh, some neighbors up, live up, look down on us. They live on the hill above us. I got to go hug them here in a minute. But anyway, let's get up. Love somebody in the Lord right now.
As we, as Suzanne's father used to say, if you'll find your way back to your nest, we'll, uh, we'll keep on in, uh, keeping on. And we're going to, Christ, as the folk were bringing him their children and the apostles and some of the adults felt like it was imposing upon Jesus for all the little ones to come and, and they wanted them to lay hands and hold them. And he said, Suffer not the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And the word suffer means to identify with. And I pray that we can identify with the zeal and the joy and, and just the great anticipation that the kiddos look for each day, each moment. And they're going to sing a special song to us, so you prayerfully receive them as we enjoy it. Sing to us, okay? Of, of the 
joy of just singing to the Lord. And I've shared with so many of you uh, years ago when we started a mission church out in Arkansas, um, I would go out on Saturdays to visit and I didn't know anybody and a lot of the men worked on Saturdays and so I'd take Amanda with me so uh, I'd have somebody to visit with me and uh, we started singing. It was 40 miles from Memphis out to the out to the little town where we started the church and and uh, we would sing together and she'd put her fingers in her ears so she could learn how to harmonize. You think it was because of my singing? Is that what you... <laughs> oh. um, but anyway, you pray for Brother Charlie anyway. Um, but as they... Now she's bringing her son with her and they're going to sing for us tonight. So you pray for Amanda and Clark. Sometimes I still try to take control I get scared when I can't see the end And all you need from me is to let go Your parting waters Making a way for me Your moving mountains That I don't even my prayer before I even speak all you need for me to be is still I bring my praise before I bring my need cause there's no fear you've not already seen Rest my heart and all your promises Cause I have seen and know your faithfulness Your parting waters Making a way for me Your moving mountains That I don't even see You've answered my prayer Before I and speak all you need for me to be is still and know that you are God be still and know that you trust that you are heart in waters Lord All you need for me to be is still. Be Amen. Thank you, Clark and Amanda. And thank you, Children's Choir. And uh, praise the Lord for people who work with uh, children uh, as they learn to sing and sing the praises of the Lord. And uh, thank you for the choir, Brother Eric. 
done a good job this week. Enjoyed that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, we've come, sometimes you think you're going to bless people, but we've come this week and you've blessed us and ministered to us. And uh, we really feel loved. So thank you so very much. You're very kind and gracious. If you would, turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 8. And then also turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 32, Exodus chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 6, <laughs> Hezekiah chapter 3, Matthew chapter 9. All right. No, as the little boy said in children's church, Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy. And stand with me as I read uh, some verses here in chapter 8. Verse 2, it says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. He led you in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, and to see whether you would keep His commandments or not. And He humbled thee, and He allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you knew not. Neither did your fathers know that He might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastens thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to fear him. Let's pray and then please be seated. Father, I thank you that you're an awesome God, you're a holy God, and you're a great God like the young people sing about tonight. But I thank you that you're so personal. And I thank you that you have a great plan for our lives, and that is to be conformed to the image of your Son. And we thank you for the example that he had on this earth. He never sinned. He loved people, He healed people, He ministered to them, He touched them, and showed us what uh, God is really like. And I thank You, Lord, for Your Word, and I pray that it would be a blessing to Your people tonight, and I pray that it would bring You honor and You glory, because we see You and see how You work, and how You plan out things, and have things with a purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> Some of you are not old enough to remember the wilderness family. But you can still see those shows and that series of shows on YouTube. Uh, it was about a family decided to move out of the city and go out in the country. They were tired of the busyness and all the hassle and uh, just the hustle and bustle of the city. So they go out and uh, they're going to build this house and they had problems getting the house built. And then lions and bears and all sorts of animals were after them. Then they were stricken with some diseases. I mean, they had all sorts of problems. And uh, snow covered their house one time to the point that they couldn't even get out the door. And then the father had to go and get medicine for the wife. And he went out in the snow and walked by himself. And I mean the wilderness family just had a tough time. Well, Moses tells us about the wilderness family called the Israelites. And we see in this passage... The Israelites had a number of problems. He used them for his purposes. And any time you have a problem, God orchestrates many of those things. God allows those things to come into our life so that he might make us 
more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see, first of all, the remembrance of the wilderness. He says in chapter 8, verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Now it was only 11 days' journey to Kadesh Barnea, but it took these Israelites 40 years to get to the promised land. Now, we need to look at this and see that the Lord led them. He led them by a pillar of fire at night and by a pillar of cloud during the day. The Lord led the Israelites in the wilderness. A lot of times we think about it was the uh, Israelites' problem because they stayed in the wilderness 40 years. Well, who... Who was responsible for the Israelites to be in the wilderness 40 years? Was it the Lord or was it the children of Israel? And the answer is yes. But they followed the Lord in that pillar by day and that fire by night. Now, just think about how the Lord has led you in your past. How many times has God allowed something to come into your life and when it came into your life, you thought, oh, my word, uh, this is uh, really tough. And I don't know all that God is doing during this time. But the Lord has a way of leading us. He led them into the wilderness. He led them in the wilderness. And then he led them out of the wilderness. One of my favorite verses in Scripture, since I've been going through some wilderness experiences in the past, is it, and it came to pass. Amen? I mean, when you're hurting and you're in trial and you're in testing and you're having problems, I mean, it, it's good to know that God's finally brought you out and it came to pass. Well, there's some remembrances about the wilderness. Second of all, I want you to see there's some reasons for the wilderness. The Lord just doesn't allow something just for allowing it, but He has a purpose in it. Let's look at these things in verse 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. He did that to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which you knew not. Neither did your fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Well, first of all, it says he allows some things, wilderness experiences, to humble us. Do you know that God has an, an elevator? He works like this. When we get a little bit too prideful and think too high of ourselves, he says, you know, I've got a responsibility to bring you down. Then it, sometimes we think, too low of ourselves and he says I need to work in his or her life and to bring them up so it says humble yourself in the sight of God and he'll lift you up and he'll honor you in due time so he uses a lot of experiences first of all to humble us a lot of times we get a little proudful uh, I remember brother Ronnie might have said that this week uh, he was talking about the Christian life thing, and he said, boy, I've kind of got this down pat, and he went to seminary and found out he didn't have it all down pat. And uh, we, none of us have it all down. But it says he did it to humble us. He uses those things to get us to the point that we will humble ourselves before him. He'll empty us of our pride because we try to do things on our own. Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the Husbandman, the, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he said, I can't, you cannot do anything apart from me. So he said, you try to be independent in your Christian life, not pray like you should, not commit yourself daily like you should to him, spend time with him. He said, you get a little prideful, think you can do it on your own. He said, okay, we'll allow a little wilderness to come into your life. So he does that to humble us. Second of all, it says, he does that, it says, to prove you, but the word is to test. It was a word for taking a, 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 
a metal and trying to find alloy and stuff in that metal to find out what was not making that metal genuine. And the Lord does that in our life. Whatever is not like it should be, not that looks like Jesus, He wants to take that out and He tests us. There was a commercial probably about the same time that this family series was on. It was about a big old gorilla. And this gorilla is sitting over here. And uh, here's a piece of luggage just kind of floating along on a luggage rack in an airport. I mean, it's just kind of going along there. And this gorilla picks up this baggage. It's a Samsonite luggage. And he takes it and he just throws it down. And then he jumps on it. And then he kicks it. Then he picks it up again. He throws it and he throws it. And I mean, he puts it to the test. And then right after he finishes, you see that luggage just going right along. See, you could tell that that luggage was genuine because it stood the test. He's going to put us through some things to see if we just fulfill the test and respond to the test. Then look what else he says. He says, to show us what is in thine heart. Now, it's important for us to realize that God knows what's in our heart. Amen? Have you ever had the preacher preach and uh, the Lord convicts you of something in your heart? And uh, you go, heart? Brother Ronnie's not talking about me, is he? And heart goes, no, he's not talking about you. That's not you. There's not that in your heart. Well, the heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17, 9 says. And the word for deceitful there is the word Yaakov. It's the word for Jacob. Jacob was a trickster. And our heart is a trickster. Sometimes you think you're going pretty good. Well, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what's in your heart. Show it something that's wrong. There could be discontent there in your heart. I'm sure you've heard about the guy that wanted to go to the monastery so he could grow spiritually. He goes into the monastery and the head monk says, at the end of this first year, you can say two words. And at the end of the first year, he said, bed hard. Waited another year and he said two more words, food bad. And then the third year at the end, he said, I quit. And the head monk said, well, I knew it. All you've done is gripe the whole three years you've been here. <laughs> well, sometimes the Lord shows us that we're just a little bit discontent. And we need to be more content with Him and His blessings. Unforgiveness sometimes. He'll take, he'll take your heart and put it up here. And He shows you how nasty it is. How bitter it is. How unforgiving it is. And He shows us to us. Sometimes He'll pick up our heart and He'll say, Look how angry you are. And He says, You know, really, at the root of your anger, you're really angry at God. Oh, my. So He shows us what's in our heart so that we can confess it and be right with Him again. In verse 3, look what he says. And he humbled thee and suffered thee and allowed thee to hunger, fed thee with manna which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make thee know that you live not by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. The Lord sometimes will produce a holy dissatisfaction in our life. We get are not dissatisfied enough sometimes with how we are as Christians and in our walk with Christ. And He'll show us that we need to be wholly dissatisfied, confess what's going on, confess we're not growing like we should, confess that we're not walking with Him like we should, confess that we're not spending enough time with the Lord, listening to Him and speaking to Him and sharing our hearts with Him. And then He not only does that to show us to us, but He has a purpose of discipline in us. Look at verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in your heart 
that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God, he chastens thee. He does not punish his children. I've heard so many Christians say, oh, I'm going through this, and God is punishing me for something. God does not punish his children. He's going to only punish those who have rejected Jesus Christ. There'll be an eternal punishment. But he doesn't punish us. He corrects us. And he disciplines us. And it's so important that we realize you're not being punished. You're just being corrected so he can straighten you and get you back on the right path. Now look at the results of the wilderness. Look what it says in verse 6. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. What are the results? First of all, he wants us to be obedient. To be faithful and do what he wants us to do. And then to walk in his ways. He wants us to be consistent. You ever get out of church and you're not too consistent? And the Lord allows a little humble pie to come in your life and remind you, Hey, I need you to be in church. I want you to grow. I want you to honor me. I want you to be obedient. And I want you to be consistent. And then also it says, and to fear Him. He wants us to be reverent. Uh, thank you for the way you worship. Uh, it's been a blessing to watch the choir. It's been a blessing to hear you, how you sing and you worship and you praise the Lord, how important is that? And we need to realize that God is in charge and God is in control. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. The words be still, it's a picture of the priest that would go into the holy place and they would take the showbread and they would change it out, put some fresh in there. Then they would put some oil in the lamps in the menorah and they would do that and do that and then they would do a number of other things in the holy place and then they would just their hands that word be still is whatever is going on in your life drop your hands take your hands off of it and then it says be still take your hands off of it and it literally says I God take your hands off I, God. Let me tell you, when I realized that it hit me that God was in control and God was in charge of my church, boy, that sure freed me up. Let me tell you, it's a lot of pressure to try to be God. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an amen out there? Any control freaks out there? Boy, let me tell you, man. Look what he said. Let go, take your hands off. I am God. Let me handle that. Suzanne's got a little thing in the window uh, over her sink and says, there's nothing that's going to come up today that I can't handle. Just relax and rest and enjoy your day. Isn't that good? Well, the results of the wilderness, to be obedient, to be consistent, and to be reverent. Somebody said last night, you finished too quick. Well, tonight I'm going to catch up. Look at, verse, look at chapter 32. It'll be worth it, though, for this next 43 minutes. It'll be worth it. Look what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 32. He found Israel in a desert land. The word there for desert is the word davar. It's a word that means to speak. God uses a wilderness to speak to our hearts sometimes. I know you joke about the story about here's a, here's a young man that's trying to learn about farming and he's trying to work with the mule and he says gee and haw to that mule and he's not responding. Well, the older farmer takes a big, big stick, whops that mule on his head and says gee. And he gets up there, he just goes this way. He said haw and ho. He, man, I mean, he just really... Just responds. Now the reason is you've got to get his attention. Well, let me tell you, nothing like a little wilderness experience to get our attention. Can I, can I hear an amen to that? And be able to hear God speak 
God, what's going on? You become serious. You start listening to him. You say, what is going on? I, I, I want to know. I want to hear. I want you to tell me why. Why, why is this happening? What's going on? Now I want you to see, first of all, there's some reassurances in the wilderness. And look what he says. He led him about. The word there is a word that means to encircle. He encircles us when we're in the wilderness. The word there for encircle is a picture of he is always present. He always is encircling us. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29, it says we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. That word predestinate there, the word prohorizo is a word that means every situation we find ourselves in it's a new horizon and that horizon is being used by God to make us like Jesus he encircles us I've done a lot of counseling and every time there is a sense of God moving or impressing upon somebody's heart he I was there when that happened to you. I was there. I knew about it. I, I care for that. I understand about that. He said, I encircle you. Second of all, he says, he teaches you. Look what he said. He instructed him. That word is a word not just to get knowledge, but to get knowledge and then give the skill to know how to get out of that situation or to teach others how to get out of a situation because you've learned the skill to be able. And then it says he protects us. Look what he said. He kept him as the apple of his eye. I know you've heard uh, that little girl is the apple of his eye. Well, that's true. But this is not the apple of the eye. The word literally is the little man in the eye. He protects the pupil by the eyelash, by the eye. What is this thing? I I lid. Oh God! Thank you. You want to finish this? <laughs> Chad says Suzanne's the best preacher in our family. So I mean. Really. But the eyelash and the eyelid and then the cornea, it protects the little man in the eye. What God says is, when I'm putting you through the wilderness experience and getting things done that I want to do in your life to make you like Christ, I don't allow some things in there at all. I protect you. So it says He protects you. And then verse 11, and I'm going to be through. You thought I was going to preach another 45 minutes. Look what He says in verse 11. As an eagle stirs up her nest and flutters over her young, she spreads abroad her wings and takes them and bears them on her wings. Now, I don't know if you studied much about eagles, but I didn't realize how big a mama eagle would build a nest. Some of them weigh as much as 100 pounds. And what she does is she takes some pieces of glass and she takes some uh, little sharp bone and rocks and a lot of pointed things in there. And then she takes some structure, bigger twigs and sticks and puts them under that, those st sharp things. And then he builds, she builds up that side part of the structure and, and the nest. And then on the inside, she puts some little dawn, of, dawn feathers out of a duck. She'll get those feathers that are out there and she'll take those and she'll put them inside that little nest. Then she'll even pluck some feathers out of her own breast and put those in there. She'll find rabbit fur and put them in there. And listen... That little eaglet has got it made. He's become a couch eaglet. He is sitting there and mama just flies around and she comes and she drops a worm in there and he goes 
Man, isn't my mama great? She is something else. She takes care of me. She loves me. Oh, I just love my mama. And then one day, his mama doesn't bring any food. What she does is she flies down. Man, she's coming, and she's coming, and gets closer to that little eaglet. And that mama eagle had that mother and wife look. You know what that is? All the men said, Amen. <laughs> so, had that look. And what she starts doing, she starts stirring the nest. She starts tearing the inside of that nest. All that soft stuff. Boy, she'll reach in there and she'll grab that and she'll throw it over here. She'll reach some of that feathers and all that fur of the rabbit and take all that stuff and just throw it over there. And that poor little eaglet, that couch eaglet, become so entitled and so spoiled. All at once, those little sharp rocks and pieces of glass and everything start entering his bottom. And you know what he does? When they start entering his bottom, it hurts. And he gets out of there. But on the way out, he grabs some of that soft stuff in there. You ever had your child when they were about Oh, eight or nine months, grab their blankie, and they suck on their thumb. That couch eaglet was doing that. He's got that little, little rabbit fur and holding it. He's sucking on his thumb, and all at once happens. His mama goes slap that. She's crazier than I thought. She pushes him over to the edge of the cliff. And pushes him over and pushes him. And he's off and he's going down. And he's going, oh, my mama's crazy. I'm going to die. And he just goes. And about that time, it says right there, she bears them up on her wings. And she picks that little eaglet up and carries him back on top of the cliff. He goes, oh, I thought I was going to die. He goes, oh, this is great. Mama loves me. He runs over there and he gets more of that nest. He's just trying to look for more of that hair, rat, rabbit fur and that hair. And he's in. And about that time she starts pushing him again. And <whistles> there he goes. And this time he puts out these two little things on the side of his body. And he doesn't go down as fast. And she picks him up again, carries him, puts him back up here. And he goes, well, maybe this time. And this time when she pushes him off. He goes down and he starts flapping. And he goes, what cool is this? And he starts flapping and he starts to fly. And he starts to soar. And he gets up way above the nest and he sees things that he's never seen before. He thought he had it good as a couch eaglet. But no, as a soaring eagle, he had it so much better. You see... God will take us out of our comfort zone. And he'll put us in a situation where we have to depend upon the Lord and learn about him. We get so comfortable sometimes, amen, and he'll allow wilderness experience to come into our lives. Well, let me tell you, that little eaglet is now flying around, around and all that because his mama pushed him out of the nest. And sometimes God has to stir our nest. Sometimes it's painful. But sometimes it's needful. There was a photographer at work for a TV station. And he was flying in a helicopter into a, an area of Alaska that nobody has ever gone and, and filmed that area. And as he went out there, that helicopter dropped him and put him out there, allowed him to float down and put him down there. And uh, He had planned. He knew how many cameras. He had 10 cameras. He had food and he had water. He had totally planned for what he was going to do because he was going to have that commentary on TV and he was be the head person to do all the photographs and all the filming. Well, after about three weeks, he ran out of food he ran out of water and he realized I didn't plan 
for my escape. I didn't plan to get out of this. And this photographer died by a nameless lake in a nameless valley because he didn't plan properly. You might be here tonight and you've not planned for eternity. Jesus Christ left heaven, came down from heaven for you. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross for you, took your sins, all of your sins for you. He was buried. He was raised on the third day and He sits right now at the right hand of God the Father. And He is asking you Please plan for your eternity and come and trust me. If you've never done that, do that tonight. That's a good time to make sure you plan for eternity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way you work in our lives. You're so good and gracious. We realize every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, even wilderness experiences come from you. And you use those to make us more like your son. To remind us to be more dependent on you. And be faithful to you and consistent. Be obedient. And revere you as the great and mighty God that you are. But also the personal God that you are. How we thank you. I pray now, Lord, as we take this invitation time, I pray that you would invite people to come to yourself. Invite someone who is here who's uh, trusted you but needs to be baptized. Somebody that's here that needs to be a part of Cedar Hill. And it could be that you are working in some young lady's life to be a missionary, some young man's life to be called into Christian service. And you have taking them out of their comfort zone. You're trying to get their attention. You're trying to speak to them. As you have spoken to them, I pray that they'd respond and be obedient to the call that you've got on their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ronnie is going to come down. He'll meet you. However God has spoken to your heart, you respond. He'll be able to counsel you and minister to you. We're going to sing number 330, Amazing Grace. Some of you know it by heart. But respond to God's amazing grace. Come to Jesus. Put your faith in Him. Whatever God wants you to do, do that tonight. For your best good and for Jesus' glory. You come, you respond. Let's sing. sing the next verse and everybody bow their head and just close out any distraction and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you he wants to speak to you you respond as he speaks if you need to come share with the pastor whatever he wants to speak to you about respond to him be obedient be consistent 
and revere him and follow him. Do what he ha would have you to do. As we sing the next verse, or Eric sings the next verse, you come. Through me. say 